Hello everybody and welcome to the fully updated item and equipment tier list for patch 1.0 of Risk of Rain 2. If you've seen any number of my previous tier lists, know that this one will have some sweeping changes to what you've seen before, so don't be too surprised if you see some radical shifts up or down. Also, if you want a reference for when you're in the game, there is a spreadsheet version of this list in the description below. I'll split the items into categories based on their rarity. I'll start with commons or whites, then move to greens, reds, etc. The ranks I give will strictly adhere to the following scale from worst to best based on an item or equipment's effect and note there are no in-between ranks f is reserved only for very specific effects that i recommend you avoid entirely d is for effects that are weak or entirely outclassed by others in the same rarity c the effects are okay but nothing special b the effect is good but either inconsistent or outclassed a the effect is great and s the effect is amazing these are the top tier items i play exclusively on monsoon difficulty and the ranks i give are indicative of the general usefulness of an effect on any survivor in any circumstance. Also, there are a handful of effects that have multiple ranks attached to them as they do perform drastically different under specific circumstances. All right, long intro. Let's begin here with the common items starting in D tier with the bustling fungus. Fungus has always had the issue of viability, not due to its numerical effect, but rather its method of activation. Standing completely still for two whole seconds is already hard enough past the first couple stages, let alone continuing to stand still while it slowly trickles your HP up. There are just far too many better sources of healing in the game to compete with for the poor old Bungus. And here's a great time to mention that multiple rank exception. The Fungus of course performs significantly better on the Engineer, specifically with his stationary turrets, to the point of it pretty much being an essential item. His turrets receive all of his items and are always standing still, so just a couple Fungus increase their tankiness by an extreme amount. The second and last item in D tier is the Focus Crystal. Similar to the Fungus, staying in melee range is too inconsistent of an effect to take advantage advantage of in most situations. This one has another obvious exception, that one being melee survivors, in which the focus crystal gets an A. In all other cases though, you just will not be that close to enemies past the first few stages, or else you're just asking to die. Moving on to C tier, we start with the bundle of fireworks. They're a fun item to stack and watch the entire stage get filled with heat-seeking death works, but aside from them being a novelty, they don't bring much else to the table. Having to interact with something on the stage means that once you, you know, run out of stuff to interact with, they're a useless item. Can you endlessly print them? Sure. Should you? Probably not. Next, Crowbar. While you may think that dealing a whopping 50% extra damage to a target is a pretty darn great effect, which it is by itself, the consistency is not. As soon as your target dips below 90% health, the Crowbar is rendered completely useless, which means unless you are literally one-shotting things, you're not getting as much bang for your buck as possible with the Crowbars. Well then, you may be asking, just save your largest instance of damage to first use while the target is still full HP, that way you'll always get the effect. In theory, yes, that's exactly what you should do, however, in practice, as in when you're actually playing the game, that's a whole lot easier said than done. Most of the time, your highest damaging thing, the one you can abuse crowbars with the most, is your equipment slot, which has a cooldown. What's better than sitting idly by, hoping that after the next 30 seconds passes by, your equipment crits, procs a band, an ATG, maybe a ukulele or two, and that the target is still above 90% health when all of those things finally happen? How about just damaging and killing stuff as usual? In this game, the less thinking your items make you do, the better. Next, energy drink. Whoa, hold up hold up. Yes, movement speed and mobility in general are both integral to staying alive in Risk of Rain 2. So why is our good friend the Energy Drink, who we've all known and loved for so long, down here in C tier? Allow me to explain. When you press your sprint key, your existing momentum is multiplied by 1.45, which is a 45% increase. Note that I said existing movement, as in whatever speed you're already moving at is what it's increased by when sprinting. Herein lies the problem with the Energy Drink. Its effect is only added to your speed after you've already begun sprinting sprinting. Okay, you say, why is this bad? It's still more speed than a goat hoof while sprinting, right? For the first stack, yes, that 30% increase from energy drink is more than what a goat hoof provides. However, for each additional stack, the 20% is actually less than a goat hoof because remember, while sprinting, all of your speed is given a 45% increase. So that 14% from the hoof turns into a 20.3% while sprinting, which is more than the energy drink. So it's not that the energy drink is bad, just that it's outclassed in every way past the first stack by the 
the goat hoof due to the hoof granting increased movement speed at all times. Next, fresh meat. A little bit of regen after killing a target is useful early on, but the flat 2 HP per second doesn't scale too well, and once your HP pool gets into the upper hundreds, there are much better healing effects to chase after than the meat. Next, gasoline. Similar to the issue with meat, the AoE damage is useful early on to wipe out groups, but once you move into the later stages, the DPS just cannot keep up with your other damage. It's nice to have, especially on survivors with little to no innate area capabilities, but it is outclassed by many other things down the road. Next, personal shield gens. It's hard to get through one of my streams, twitch.tv slash gaming <laughs> without clarifying the shield gens effect on your one-shot protection, so I'll just start with that. If you didn't know, there is a hidden mechanic, although it's not that hidden anymore with the health bar update in 1.0, called one-shot protection protection. If you are at or above 90% of your combined max HP, which is your regular health plus any shields, not barrier that you have, you cannot die to one instance of damage. There are a few more things to one shot protection, such as its lingering duration, but in regards to the shield gens, the problem is not that shields remove or disable your one shot protection, but rather significantly alter how it's kept up. See, your shields cannot be leached or regen normally. The only way to restore missing shields is to take absolutely no damage for 7 seconds and then allow them to fill up back to their full amount, which takes no longer than two seconds. This is the issue with shields and one-shot protection. If you take heavy damage and lose your one-shot protection, you do not want to be stuck around waiting for that close to 10 seconds until it is back up. Everyone who's gotten past the first loop knows that there are plenty, and I mean plenty of things that can one-shot you in your run, so why would you want to intentionally gimp yourself by not having one-shot protection up as much as possible? Now, are shield gens bad? No, not necessarily. Extra HP is pretty nice to have. But is the tiny amount of HP the shield gens actually provide you worth the trade-off of being wary of a one-shot around every single corner? Not to mention your overall reduction to healing and regen capabilities. To me, no it's not, which is why the shield gen receives a C. Next, rusted key. While you have at least one key, a lockbox will spawn in a random place on each stage, which when open gives you a random item whose rarity is based on how many keys you have in total. So more keys equals better loot. The issue is that you really have to go out of your way to scout for it. You'll probably miss the lockbox too many times in a run to count. Can you print keys on keys on keys and hunt the lockbox down every single stage for a free red item, quote unquote? I mean, yeah, if you want to lose all of your other common items in the process. But being realistic, something like that isn't going to happen until like the end of your second loop and beyond anyway, which makes the consistency of the keys effect not very high to say the least. Next, stun grenade. Disabling targets for a short amount of time is useful for things like Elder Lemurians, Imps, Golems, and such, but many other dangerous enemies are immune to stuns, most notably bosses. So their overall effect is limited. Just grab a couple stacks of stun grenade for the smaller guys and then forget about them. Lastly, War Banner. It was buffed here in the 1.0 patch to not drop whenever you activate the teleporter, as well as when you level up. While it's a good change, it wasn't enough to propel the war banner any further up the ranks. It's still a rather small area to play around for the slight increase to movement and attack speed, so similar to the stun grenade, if you have a few stacks, cool. Otherwise, it's not a big deal to be absent in your runs. Moving up to B tier, we start with the Cautious Slug. The slug provides some of, if not the best early game healing around, with the only requirement being you not taking damage while the healing occurs. It's always nice to have a couple slugs so that the option of retreating, I mean tactically withdrawing, from a situation and regaining any lost HP is available. Next, Monster Tooth. This is like the inverse slug. The more damage you have and the faster you kill things, the more you are rewarded for being aggressive with the tooth healing you per enemy killed. Why the jump into B tier? Because the addition of the maximum HP heal on top of the flat amount. It's still great to have a couple teeth early on, but now they scale a teeny bit into the mid game as well, whereas before they'd be next to useless upon arriving in stage 4. It's always nice to see a tooth or two pop up in the first couple stages. Next, repulsion armor. The flat damage reduction is applied to all sources of damage, including damage over time, which is the main reason to pick these bad boys up. 5 flat damage per stack doesn't scale too well when the enemies start dealing thousands of damage per shot, but it is pretty good when damage over times barely get into the 50s and 60s in the first loop, let alone the hundreds. Just two or three repulsions can and probably will save your life from a pack of magma worms or imp overlords. Lastly, Sticky Bomb. What can I say? The little guys have grown on me a bit since their blatant execution way back in Scorched Acres. I'm kidding, they were definitely too OP and needed a nerf. Having the extra 180% damage at the end of your proc chains is quite useful to pump your overall damage up, and otherwise getting the occasional bomb to proc isn't a bad thing either. After all, more damage is always the right answer. Moving on now to the A tier, we start with Armor Piercing Rounds. With the addition of the final boss on stage 6, Armor Piercing Rounds have received an indirect buff and are very much worth taking multiple stacks of early on into a run. They were never bad to get, just less desirable than others past the first one or two stacks. But now? 
If you plan on taking down the final boss, especially, you need some armor piercings in your run. On top of that, they also help with the regular teleporter fights by significantly reducing the amount of time you focus on the boss and more on the other threats that spawn, which, you know, you're kind of doing that whole process once per stage. So yeah, they're pretty useful, I'd say. Next, Backup Magazine. Every survivor's secondary ability is quite powerful, usually relating to AoE damage in some way. So having additional charges of it is, surprise, surprise, a powerful effect. Not much else to say about this one. Next, Medkit. Along with the Monster Tooth, Medkit also received a nice percent HP heal on top of the flat amount, but the nature of the Medkit's effect bumps it all the way up into A tier. Getting healed after you take damage being a good thing is a no-brainer, right? Well, by now healing 5% of your health per stack, Medkit's consistency was drastically increased. It feels really good to get to stage 5, get smacked by an overloading brass contraption, and then healing back 15% of the damage lost just by running away. Without multiple stacks, sure, the heal isn't anything to write home about, but the sheer number of hits you'll be taking actually ends up restoring more HP overall than all but the best forms of healing in the game. Seriously, the new med kits feel great. Next, Soldier's Syringe. Never did I think the day would come where the syringes and med kits were in the same tier, yet here we are. Now, is this because their effects are similar enough in strength to warrant the same tier? No, actually. It's simply that the syringes aren't unique enough in their effect. There are so many other sources of attack speed in this game that the need for anything more than six or seven syringes is complete overkill in my opinion. The Zerker Pauldron, Warhorn, Predatory Instincts, all of these items give significantly more than 15% attack speed per stack, so why waste your white scrap or items in general on printing syringes? Again, I do recommend getting a handful, 5-7 to seven syringes to get that baseline attack speed up, but past that point, simply rely on other sources. Lastly, Topaz Brooch. Barrier is a valuable asset to have at any point in a run. You know, having more HP and all that kind of stuff. Past the first few stages, it takes quite a few, anywhere from 7 to 10 stacks of roads to reasonably maintain your total pool, so be sure to keep that investment in mind when you do find a printer. Moving now to the tippity top of the common items S tier, starting with lens makers glasses. Critical strikes double your damage. One pair of glasses grants 10% crit, so you can think of this relationship as each stack of crit glasses granting 10% more damage. The only exception to this rule would be damage over time, as those hits deal base damage and cannot be scaled by crits. But for the vast majority of other sources of damage, crits scale them extremely well. I recommend to stop printing crit glasses at 9 stacks, not 10, as both the Predatory Instincts and Harvester Scythe give an additional 5% crit, and chances are, if you found a crit printer, you probably have, or will shortly have, a single Predatory or Scythe. Next, Paul's Goat Hoof. I pretty much detailed this item in the Energy Drinks explanation, but I'll give you a quick rundown here again. The 14% movement speed per stack is applied to you at all times, and on top of that, when you sprint, all of your momentum is given a 45% increase, meaning each stack of a hoof effectively grants 20.3% movement speed while sprinting. This makes the goat hoof undoubtedly better for energy drink in every way. It affects you while strafing, jumping, walking, sprinting, everything. I can't stress enough how important the ability to quickly dodge threats is in this game, making the goat hoof not only one of the best commons, but one of the best items overall to get in your run. Runs. Next, Tougher Times. When all else fails and you do inevitably make a mistake, <gasps> Tougher Times is always there to have your back. It has a pretty self-explanatory effect, giving chance to completely block incoming damage, both from direct hits and over time, but its numerical values are a different story. In short, it scales hyperbolically, meaning it receives less and less benefit per stack and can never truly reach a 100% chance. The specific formula for block chance is this, but don't worry about trying to do the math in your head while playing the game, as a good breakpoint to always remember is that 10 teddy bears equals 60% block chance exactly. So whenever I find a teddy printer, I like to stop at 10 stacks for that 60% block because it feels amazing in the majority of situations and doesn't require too much investment. Also, your luck stat, which is increased by the clover and decreased by purity, has no effect on teddy bears. Finally, oh baby, you know it, the tri-tip dagger. What else can I even say other than that bleeds are now essentially permanent and scale infinitely? Like, how is that not absolutely busted? It's important to note here that the chance to bleed is affected by whatever the proc coefficient of the hit is, meaning if you're using something like Commando's Primary, which has a 1.0 coefficient, you need 7 daggers to cap your bleed, whereas something like the Captain's Primary with its 0.75 proc coefficient means that you would need 9 stacks to cap it. <laughs> Get it? Cap you bleed while playing the Captain? Okay, never mind. Seriously though, bleeds are insane sources of single target DPS, and in their current state, tri-tip daggers are extremely easy to scale up to the point of melting through even the tank 
luckiest of enemies. Jumping to the next tier of uncommon items, let's begin here again with the D ranks. Starting with the left on Daisy. Yes, this thing has saved my life multiple times, but I cannot justify placing it any higher because of its consistency. Um, actually, the left on Daisy is always activated at even intervals during the teleporter's charge, which is actually the very definition of consistency. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Shimmer. Well, yeah, okay, the effect is literally consistent. In reality, there's no guarantee that you are missing a large chunk or really any HP at all when it goes off. Again, there are times where the Daisy pops in in the heat of battle and smacks you in the face with that much needed 50% heal, but those times are very few and far between the others where it just kind of pops out and fizzles away like a stagnant fart. The only other item joining the Daisy in D tier is the Squid Poglip. Simply put, there is far too much competition in the green rarity to give the Poglips anything higher than a D. Their effect is lackluster and their consistency is extremely low. That's it. You have to interact with something to get them to spawn, so fireworks. But once they're there, they do negligible damage and literally kill themselves by just sitting around. Their 30 second duration is not an actual timer, but rather tied to their HP, which slowly reaches zero over 30 seconds, meaning sure, if you manage to heal them, they can stay alive for longer than 30 seconds at a time. But uh, yeah, you go ahead and play around your poglips and keeping them alive as long as possible. Let me know how that works out for you. Moving up to C tier, starting with Bandolier. To me, Bandolier perfectly represents an average item. It has a great effect, completely resetting all of your cooldowns, including fully restoring any charges on your charge based abilities. But said effect is gated behind killing an enemy and successfully hitting the percent chance to drop. It's always good to have a couple bandolier stacks, but you're never going to get to the point of saying, wow, my bandoliers sure are carrying this run right now. And that's OK. Next, Chrono Bobble. By itself, the effect is pretty much worthless, but when paired with the death mark item, which is the sole reason for the Bobble's C rank, it proves itself quite useful. Let me make it clear. Slowing enemies is not a valuable trait due to the vast majority of enemies having ranged attacks and the slow only applies to their movement speed. But again, it is worth having just one bobble for the death mark. Next, Old War Stealth Kit. Similar to the Daisy, there are definitely times where the stealth kit can save your life or at the very least give you some much needed breathing room to escape a threat and reassess your approach. But for the most part, it just kind of sits there in your inventory. Not a great item, but definitely not a bad one to have either. Next, Red Whip. The speed it provides can help you traverse the stages quicker and increase your overall DLPH, they include per hour, but you'll soon realize that, oh shoot, I still need to kill some stuff. And suddenly the whip takes the back seat and out come the big boys. Lastly, Rose Buckler. Again, another pretty neat effect gated behind inconsistency. There's one, no guarantee that you'll be sprinting while taking damage, and two, no guarantee that you'll be taking damage while sprinting. See the point? Outside of a few edge cases like the Huntress, where you can effectively be sprinting and maintaining full DPS at all times, you won't get much mileage out of the Rose Buckler. Moving up to B tier, starting with Berserker Pauldron. A nice chunk of movement and attack speed when killing enemies in quick succession is a very good effect. As I explained with syringes, there are many sources of attack speed and the Zerker Pauldron is one of those sources. So long as you have a bit of innate AoE and a few items to aid you, you should have no problem maintaining the Zerker Pauldron procs when they matter the most, such as during the teleporter. Next, Infusion. I've actually come to appreciate the Infusion's HP increase more and more, especially with the addition of Stage 5 and its crazy enemy types. There have been more and more threats gradually added to the game, including the 10% increased difficulty scaling with the current patch, so Infusion has thus become more and more lucrative. Having an additional 1 or 200 HP alone makes a world of a difference when you reach stage 5 and have just under 500 total health. Hashtag just hunters things. Next, Leeching Seed. Similar to the relationship of hooves versus energy drinks, the Leeching Seed simply pales in comparison to the Harvester's Scythe. I'll explain more once we get there, but in short, the 1 HP per stack of seed is useful early on, but quickly falls off without multiple stacks, which you'd be better off getting in sights instead. Again, it's definitely useful to have a seed or two early on, and it's not a bad bad item, it just gets outclassed quickly. Next, Razor Wire. You do not grab a Razor Wire and suddenly expect to annihilate everything in sight when you take damage. Rather, you think, huh, what if I purposefully get bled or ignited here? Sure enough, that is where the Razor Wire shines the most, where you intentionally get inflicted with a damage over time, such as a Magma Worm Burn or an Imp Overlord Bleed, the Hellfire Tincture equipment, etc, etc, and automatically retaliate back. The power that gives you in the early stages is the sole reason I'm giving Razor Wire a B rank, because otherwise, yeah, it's a pretty poopy item. And 
obviously, yes, Rex performs much better with razor wire than the other survivors due to, you know, killing himself with his own abilities. I'd give it an A, not an S on Rex because the stacking effect is not that amazing. Lastly, Warhorn. Here's another example of a great source of attack speed and it has a rather consistent effect to boot. Now, with something like the Prion Accumulator and its 140 second cooldown, yeah, that isn't the greatest of synergies. However, with something like the Gnarled Wood Sprite or Royal Capacitor, Warhorn's uptime can be close to, if not totally permanent. Heck, even picking up a blast shower isn't that terrible of an idea before you find a top tier equipment just to maintain your warhorn. Moving on now to A tier, we start with Death Mark. Its effect, 50% increased damage to a marked target, is absolutely gargantuan, but needing four separate debuffs to trigger it is what's holding this guy back from an S rank. Things that count as debuffs are basically anything that shows above the health bar of the enemy. So slows, burns, bleeds, and such. It's very important to note that a stun is not a debuff, so stun grenades do not count towards the death marks proc. Some survivors come with debuffs in their kit, such as Acrid, Artificer, and Rex, who actually comes with two, ooh, what a special little robot. So keep that in mind when you're looking for more things to proc the death mark. Next, Gore's Tome. Like Infusion, I've come to enjoy the tome's effects more and more. Even with a single stack, the amount of time the tomes can save you in the long haul can be significant, which makes it a very valuable pickup the earlier you are in your run. Yeah, once things are spawning left and right, its procs become less important, but until that point, it's always nice to see a little gold pile I'll plop out from an enemy. Its wording is a little bit vague. All the skills over time part means is that when you arrive on a stage, the gold granted by the tome is at a bare minimum, the same amount as the cost of a regular chest or multi shop. And this amount increases in tandem with your in game difficulty. So if you're on stage one, a tome will grant at least 25 gold. And if you're on like stage 10, where the chests are 2000 gold, a tome will also give at least 2000 gold. Next, Kiaro's band. It's safe to say that yes, the changes to ice and fire bands are absolutely absolutely a buff to their overall effectiveness. Wait, how is fire ban only A tier? Doesn't it do more damage than ice? Yes, but again, it's all about consistency. Ice ban's damage happens immediately when it procs, while the fire ban relies on the tornado staying on target for the full duration. Yes, the tornado's area was increased drastically compared to what it was before, but I've noticed the chance for it to stay on target for all but the largest enemies, like the alloy worship unit, is quite low. Enemies simply move far too much and or are just small themselves, so even the slightest movements can take them completely out of its damage. Again, yes, the band changes are amazing, and yes, they are absolutely still top tier items, but Fire Band is the less desirable out of the two. Next, Old Guillotine. Like the Sticky Bombs, our Lord and Savior, the Guillotine has also relinquished its throne as King. The bump down from S to A is warranted for twofold. One, it was nerfed numerically, going from 20% execute to 13. Note that this value also scales like teddy bears, where each stat gets less and less powerful and can never truly reach 100%. And two, the elites themselves were actually nerfed substantially with this patch, the Malachites and Celestine lost more than 20% of their total HP. So those changes combined place the guillotine down here in A tier. It's still a great item, obviously, just not as essential as it was before. Lastly, Wax Quail. It continues to be a staple for your overall movement in any run, all while only needing a few stacks to truly shine. In fact, Quail has kind of an interesting balance where the more stacks you have, the less powerful the item becomes. And I'm not talking about scaling, I'm saying you do not want to have more than three or four Quail else you'll be shot forwards at such a large distance that it straight up becomes uncontrollable. Stop at three quails, that is more than enough momentum for dodging threats. Moving on now to the big boys of the uncommons, S tier, starting with the ATG missile. I mean, come on, is there any reason why this guy isn't a top tier item, deals a hefty amount of damage, has a decent proc chance, and can cascade your damage into insane levels and proc chains due to having a 1.0 proc coefficient. However, while there is absolutely no reason why the ATG isn't S tier, I can't really say it's alone in its place as the best damage item overall anymore. Uh oh, sneaky foreshadowing. Next, Fuel Cell. An additional charge and decreased cooldown for your equipment per stack? Yep, sign me right up. Your equipment slot is an extremely important choice for any successful run, and an item that directly benefits every single equipment out there is a fantastic pickup in any circumstance. Not much else to say. Next, Harvester's Scythes. All right, let's take it back to the Leeching Seat. One HP per hit, not a bad effect, remember? Well, the Scythe grants eight health, only four for each additional stack, but requires that hit to be a critical strike. Thing is, crits aren't that rare to come across. In fact, with just the scythe alone, your crit chance is 6%, 5% from the item and 1% from your survivor's innate crit, meaning that eight HP per crit can be averaged out to 0.48 per hit, which is 6% of the value. However, even with just a single pair of crit glasses on top, so 16% total crit, a single stack of scythe now grants 1.28 HP per hit, which is more than the leeching seat. And 
And on top of that, that's just with one scythe and one pair of crit. If you get more of either of those, you increase this amount even further compared to the leeching seed. So yes, scythe is undoubtedly the king of leech while it's dual scaling with both more crit and, you know, more scythes exists. Next, Hopu Feather. In a game where traversing the stages can prove difficult without the necessary verticality, as well as movement in general being such an important factor to staying alive, the Hopu Feather is always an amazing asset to have. One jump? How about five? Maybe even 10, who cares? The more, the merrier. Staying above your enemies while also maintaining complete directional control is something that only the Hopu Feather can grant you, which warrants its place here in S tier. Next, Predatory Instincts. Yet another source of attack speed, and in my opinion, the best one. The more you crit, the more attack speed you get. Crit is plentiful enough to come by, so maintaining your stacks of predatory is deceptively easy. And once you do reach capped crit, there is no stopping the flurry of hits coming the enemy's way. I highly recommend holding off on extreme amounts of syringes due to the consistency of predatory. Next, Runald's Band. Ah, here we are, the Ice Band. As I've already said, the band changes feel amazing to play with, and the Ice Band is now the unequivocal definition of consistent damage. To understand why, let's talk about how the bands now proc. They are no longer related to chance, but rather are guaranteed to proc if your hit's base damage is 400% or greater. I place emphasis on base because effects like critical strikes, crowbars, focus crystals, armor piercing rounds, etc. do not increase the base base of a hit and rather scale the total amount. Basically, if the percent of whatever hit you're using to determine the band proc is not 400% or more, you will never see a band proc on that hit, regardless of crit, boss type, crowbars, etc. Now, what does this mean for their consistency overall? Well, very few survivors lack an ability with 400% damage in their most optimal loadout, which will be the next video I put out, and zero survivors lack an ability overall that has at least 400% damage associated with it. In fact, that's probably why the rather arbitrary 400% base damage was used for their proc, as it gives every survivor a chance to use them with their innate abilities and not from external sources like items or equipment. And that brings up the next point I want to cover, proccing bands via items and equipment. This is why the change just feels so good. Being able to hold your bands until you release a capacitor shot or proc an ATG and have the bands deal massive damage based off of that is a much needed mechanic of player agency that we've been missing out on. To intentionally chunk large targets via ice or fire band proc and to do that consistently is the main reason why the band changes are excellent. Ice band proves more useful overall in its instantaneous damage rather than relying on the tornado to stay on target, which is why it receives an S and not an A. Next, ukulele. Proc chains will still make up the majority of your overall damage in a run, despite the massive bleed changes, and the ukulele is still the most common source to find and get those chains a-going. A single stack can turn the tides of an otherwise lackluster run, and with multiple, the screen-wide death capabilities cannot be understated. Finally, Will of the Wisps. Similar to ukuleles, the primary use of these bad boys is to begin proc chains. Wisps also have the added benefit of being more of a nuke than a consistent source of AoE, so if you manage to bundle up a group of mobs and then get a chain reaction of explosions to take place, you'll probably end up destroying everything on the entire stage in the process. Moving on to the next rarity, the legendary items, starting here in C tier with the Dio's best friend. Legendary items are where most of the sweeping changes I mentioned at the start of the video are taking place. The Dio's, however, is not one of those changes. It continues to be a great effect gated behind a terrible consistency. Think of it like this. Dio's only does something when you die, and when you do, it goes straight back to doing nothing again. Yes, it literally prevents your death and thus your run from ending, but you know what else would do that? How about any other item in the game that actually does something like provide damage, mobility, or healing? Yeah, Dio's does none of that. I mean, not even the expired bear after the fact counts as an actual item. It's untiered, meaning it can't be printed or scrapped. There are simply far better items to get whenever you open a legendary chest or get lucky enough to see one as a random drop. Next, Frost Relic. The AoE and damage have both been gradually increased throughout the game's early access lifespan, and now, in the full release, those changes really haven't accumulated to anything much different than what it was before. It's still a small area and does negligible damage relative to other sources. Yes, it's better on melee survivors, but again, I'd much rather have many different reds than a Frost Relic, even on them. Next, Head Stomper. Despite it getting some chunky buffs in this patch, it sadly suffers the same fate as the Frost Relic, being outclassed by too many other items. The extra jump height is fine, albeit it gets annoying when you get to a certain point in your run where you feel like you're just floating forever. The fall damage negation is great, but more of a novelty than anything, and 
and the damage? Well, you tell me how likely you are to hit that boss in the middle of a sea of lesser wisps, imps, brass contraptions, and greater wisps. Also, whoops, a blazing elder Lemurian is there too, and oh, a Malachite just spawned on top of that. Have fun dropping in to say hi. Next, Happiest Mask. It's always been a cute little item with not much tangible benefit. The ghosts draw aggro off of you and deal some okay damage, I guess, but let's be honest, you really only picked this up because it's a smiley face. Next, Interstellar Desk Plant. It pleases me to say that the Desk Plant has been buffed enough to be designated as a mid-tier item. Woo! Sadly, it's still one of the worst red items to get, as you'll find few and far situations in between to actually warrant standing still within some tiny healing zone on the ground for extended periods of time. You'll either A, have enough healing already to be fine, or B, have threats around that prevent you from standing around a small circular zone. It's not nearly as bad as it used to be, but you'd be remiss to get this item over anything else. Next, Nukahana's opinion. The wording on the item is a bit confusing. Basically, as you heal, you fire skulls out that deal damage based on your max HP. Getting more HP increases the skull's direct damage while getting more healing increases the rate at which you fire them. Unfortunately, the damage per hit is far too low to enable a meaningful playstyle of running around and basically melee range and having your skulls kill everything. And thus, the Nukahana stays in C tier. However, on the engineer and his bungle buddies, the Nukahana performs considerably better than on anybody else, in which I'd give it an A. Lastly, Wake of Vultures. The item is a fantastic concept, however, in its current state, elite affixes are just too weak for players to use. The strongest ones, the Celestine and Malachite, are mostly that way because the monsters themselves gain massive HP and damage, while players only get the actual elite effect and not any stat increases. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we need to get the stat increases as well for this item to become actually useful, just that the elite affixes in general are not that good, and by extension, the Wake of Vultures. Moving on now to B tier, well, this is awkward, there's only one. Aegis. I thought about it for a bit on what should be here, but ultimately concluded that the Aegis should be by itself due to having a decent effect with some decent uptime. Normally that would warrant a C rank, but due to the legendary item's uniqueness in their effects, as well as their general power, I started their ranks at C. So here we are with the Aegis at a B. By having just a couple brooches and a handful of Legion Seeds, Sites, or other healing sources, you can maintain a good portion, if not all of your barrier, with a single Aegis. Not too shabby. But in comparison to the rankings above it, Aegis can't really compete. Moving up into A tier, we begin with the Alien Head. 25% cooldown reduction to all abilities, including their charge recovery time, is a very powerful effect. Not really much else to say here, right? Next, Brain Stocks. 25%? Ha! How about completely removing the cooldowns instead? Take that, Alien Head! Except not really because there is a local 0.5 second cooldown for all abilities, so if you've ever wondered why you can't literally just hold an ability down and watch it spam at the speed of light whenever you get a Brain Stocks proc, that would be why. Still, once you get later into your run, the sheer number of elites will enable Brain Stocks uptime to be near permanent, and at the very least, it will be up when you need it most. Next, Brilliant Behemoth. You can think of this as 60% more damage if you'd like, but technically it only applies to things with an above zero proc coefficient, meaning damage over times, and your precious fire and ice bands do not receive the damage increase. Still, the vast majority of hits do get the benefit of the Behemoth, making it an extremely powerful item to get at any point. Next, Resonance Disc. While not as lucrative as its bigger brother, the Ceremonial Daggers, Resonance Disc still packs quite the punch in dealing with anything less than the teleporter boss itself. Even so, you can still get some pretty nutty disc procs that absolutely one-shot everything in their path. Definitely deserves the A rank. Next, Unstable Tesla Coil. Once you get a Tesla, you never have to worry about these small enemies again. Lesser Wisps, Lemurians, Imps, all of those guys are rendered obsolete immediately. It's also pretty good for general damage, but the main purpose is to keep your screen clear of the lesser distractions and keep you focused on the big ones. Lastly, Hard Light Afterburner. On the loader and captain, yep, you bet your little butt that it gets an S rank, but for everybody else, the A tier is where the hard light belongs. For the majority of survivors, their utility ability is important for maneuvering around the map and dodging threats, and obviously doing more of that is a great thing. For the loader and captain, basically their entire identity revolves around their utilities, and thus the item is more potent on them. All right, now for S tier, starting with none other than the 57 leaf clover. Again, as I mentioned, the clover and purity are the only two items that modify your luck stat. Clover does so in a positive manner. For each point of luck, meaning for each clover that you have, all of your item's effects, except for teddy bears, are rolled again if they do not result in a positive outcome. For most examples, this 
would mean if whatever the chance something has to happen is not met, so an ATG's 10% chance to fire, the Clover will then re-roll that chance and hope that it is met. To calculate the odds of something happening with the Clover, simply take the chance of it not happening, and in the case of the ATG, that would be a 90% chance to not fire, and multiply it by itself. Don't worry, there's a whole wiki page on this stuff. If you want more examples, I'm not going to sit here all day to explain it. In fact, I'm going to make a separate video on the topic of Clover versus Purity in the next couple weeks, so look out for that. To summarize, Clover is the best item in the game. There are so many effects related to chance in this game, and the Clover gets better the more of those chances you have. I should note here quickly that the Clover does not affect loot obtained in any way, shape, or form, period. Well, except for Lunar Coins, but hey, that would have been less dramatic to include. Okay. Next, Ceremonial Daggers. These puppies still reign king over the dominion that is on kill effects. Nothing can even compare to the heat-seeking daggers that fly out and are able to proc your other items on top. Now, they do require a bit of scaling to probably enter the entire screen death phase, but that scaling isn't much. So long as you have some on-hit items, crit chance, or other means of damage, your daggers will reward you greatly. Next, Rejuvrak. It doubles all of your healing. Yes, all of it. Next, Sentient Meat Hook. This thing is like the ukulele on steroids. Remember how important ukuleles were to proc chaining and how important proc chaining is in general? Yep, this guy just takes all of that and does it even better. In fact, when you do get a meat hook, it's almost guaranteed to be after a ukulele, save for some absolutely nutty RNG on your end, and it's like you've never even experienced proc chains before once you get it. Lightning bolts and hooks will start flying out on every single enemy, not to mention any other on hits you have. No, I'm not exaggerating. In fact, I would say meat hooks are right behind the clover as the second best item in the entire game. Next, Shattering Justice. The only enemies in the game to have armor are bosses and scavengers, with the default value being 20, so reducing 60 armor is quite potent. If you play League of Legends, the damage that armor mitigates follows the same formula exactly. So picture entirely negating a chain vest and ninja tabby Malphite's armor, yeah, that's about the same level of damage you're getting versus things with a shattering justice. Lastly, Soulbound Catalyst. Reducing the cooldown of your equipment by 4 seconds is powerful enough on its own, especially when paired with the lower cooldown equipment like Royal Capacitor and Missile Launcher, but to get that every single kill, woo! And hey, you should be using your equipment for damage anyway, meaning you'll already be killing stuff with it, and thus the Soulbound's effect can cascade very quickly to provide some insane value. Moving on now to the next tier, boss items, starting in D with pearls. Kind of an odd way to start the boss items, as these things don't actually drop from any boss, and rather they're from the Cleansing Pools Interactable, which is essentially a 3D printer for lunar items. Still, it's yellow, so therefore in the boss category. 10% HP is not much of a gain when trading in a lunar item, especially because, you know, you kind of picked up that lunar item intentionally, so yeah. The regular pearl gets D tier. Next, Queen's Gland. With the addition of the new boss items, Queen's Gland just isn't as desirable anymore. Not that it really was to begin with. The pet beetle doggo that follows you around is cute, sure, but it lacks damage once you reach stage 3, and other than that is like a walking bullet sponge that ends up jumping off cliffs more than actually doing anything useful for you. Moving on to C tier, starting with Genesis Loop. Similar to the Lepton Daisy, yes, this thing has saved my life multiple times, however, its effect is too inconsistent to warrant a higher rank. But Willy, once you reach low HP, it always goes off, and that's the definition of- Nuh-uh, uh, -uh, uh stop right there. Nope, when I mention consistency, I mean the rate at which something actually happens. How often do you get low enough for the loop to proc, and in such a scenario, how often does the loop do something that you otherwise couldn't? As in, how often does it truly wipe your screen and take out threats that would have killed you instantly? Rarely, at best. Most of the time, I'll just get smacked by a golem, go down to 10% HP, thanks one shot protection, and be like, oh cool, now I don't have to kill things outright and let the Vagrant Wiener take them out. That's convenient. Next, Halkion Seed. Man, oh man, do I wish the Aurelianite we got was cooler than he is. I mean, he is cool already, just not useful. He's like a bigger beetle guard, and that's about all I have to say. Lastly, Little Disciple. This effect is very similar to Nukahana's opinion in that you fire some heat-seeking shots out that don't deal a ton of damage. The difference is that the Little Disciple activates just by you running around and nothing else. However, while it's consistent, the effect itself is rather weak and doesn't do much damage to change the tides of your run, especially when compared to other yellows and greens. Remember, the boss items can only drop from the teleporter event, and thus they compete directly with greens. Moving on to B tier, we have the first new boss boss item, Molten Perforator. Against larger targets and stationary ones especially, the Perforator performs quite well, but against anything less, the cone pattern that the projectiles spew out of makes it wildly inconsistent. On top of that, if the shots do land, they deal negligible damage and inflict a weak burn. Still, it's a cool item to get, and you can get some good value out of it, just, again, compared to others, it's not anything special. Lastly, Titanic Neural. It gives flat HP and HP regen. Both are useful, but the main draw is definitely the regen 
as your base amount on Monsoon is so low that a single Neural within the first loop increases your ability to take chip damage, small hits here and there, by a significant margin. Definitely a pleasant sight to see as the boss reward. Moving up, there's only one item here in A tier, and it's another new one, the Mired Urn. It essentially gives you a claimed Dune Strider suck, attaching to one enemy per stack and slowing them while healing yourself. The amount you heal is based on the damage you deal, so once you get some crit chance, you will essentially double the healing of the suck. Quite a nice effect to have. And finally, the S tier boss item, starting with the Irradiant Pearl. Again, the pearls aren't really boss items, but who cares? It's a yellow item. The Irradiant Pearl gives a 10% increase to all of your stats, rather than just your HP. This includes HP, HP region, crit, armor, damage, attack speed, and movement speed. Yeah, that's a little better than just 10% HP, right? As far as yellow items come, it's about as good as it gets. However, the chance to acquire one is low. In fact, so astronomically low that in my over 700 hours and countless runs since the cleansing pools were released, I have gotten exactly zero irradiance. There is a 4% chance that a cleansing pool contains an irradiant pearl instead of a regular one, so you take that and the fact that you need to find a pool in the first place, and yup, it's pretty darn rare. Lastly, and the real boss item here, Shatter Spleen. Holy moly, this thing is nuts. It applies a guaranteed bleed for every crit that you deal. Yes, this means things that fire multiple shots, such as Huntress's Flurry or Captain Shotgun, each shot will apply a bleed. And if that wasn't enough, enemies that are bleeding explode on death, dealing damage based on your damage and their max HP. And if that was enough, the bleed is completely separate from tri-tips, meaning if you already have capped bleed, it doesn't matter. You're just applying two bleeds for every hit at that point instead of one. Absolutely bonkers item and well-deserving of S tier. All right, moving on now to lunar items, starting in D tier with the corpse bloom. I have an entire video dedicated to this item and by gosh, I've already been writing this script for too long already, so go watch that video if you want all the details on it. In short, take a corpse bloom if you plan on doing obliteration runs or fighting the final boss on stage six, specifically on stage six. In all other cases, avoid this item like the plague as it will shaft your overall healing completely. Lastly, the new addition of purity. As I said before, I will be making a separate video covering purity and the clover in depth, but until then, I'm giving it a D rank as the downside of being a reverse clover, you know, the polar opposite of the literal best item in the entire game, is not worth the upside of shaving a mere two seconds off of your cooldowns, except on Artificer, Loader, and Acrid. Man, if you haven't tried this thing out on those survivors, you need to, as their playstyles exclusively revolve around waiting for their abilities to come off of cooldown, and they scale poorly with attack speed and the usual on-hit proc chain meta, so those two reasons combined, as well as the ban changes making them not affected by luck, makes the purity actually an extremely strong lunar on those three specifically. I'd give it an S. Other than that, though, yeah, don't take this thing. Moving on now to C tier, starting with Mercurial Rackies. This is a new lunar item that periodically drops a little spine looking thing in a random area that grants anything inside of it increased damage. The randomness of its placement coupled with the fact that everything gets the damage bonus means that its uses are limited at best. But hey, that's kind of the whole point of lunars in the first place, right? You only take them for specific reasons. Next, Shaped Glass. This one pains me quite a bit. The item itself was untouched with the update, however, its effect on the player was not. Long story short, if you are under a curse of at least 10%, curses reduce your maximum HP by their amount, then your one-shot protection is removed entirely. Meaning, yes, taking just a single stack of shaped glass with its 50% curse means you lose your one-shot protection entirely. You can still get away with one, maybe two stacks of it in a regular run, and you can still stack it like crazy and go for the whole, if I either sneeze on you or you sneeze on me, we're both dead approach, but the days of stacking glass for a free win are now gone. Sad times indeed. Next, Strides of Heresy. Still a solid option for utility on some survivors, but I don't quite find the effect useful enough to warrant dropping my already existing skill in its place. Try it out and see if you like it, but it's not a great item either way. Next, Transcendence. Similar to Strides, try it out a few times and see if the shield-based gameplay is more of your style than welling on things to recover HP. Remember, shields begin to recharge after seven seconds and they take an additional two seconds to fill completely, meaning you'll need to be in the habit of running around and hiding when reaching dangerous HP levels. Of course, of course, that's kind of the whole point with Transcendence to avoid getting that low of HP in the first place by reaching some insane amounts. But be warned, enemies never stop scaling. They will catch up to you. And if you do make that one mistake, you're still just as dead as someone who did not take 15 stacks of Transcendence. Lastly, Visions of Heresy. Again, similar to both Transcendence and Strides, it's more of a side grade than anything. It's useful on some survivors who lack a consistent primary, but I prefer everyone else's primary over it. And yes, if you take it on the captain in his current 
state, it will grant you 12 shots of your orbital strike, but this is a bug and confirmed to be fixed with the next update. It is not an antenna mechanic. Moving on to B tier, starting with Brittle Crown. Yikes, the crown is higher than shaped glass. What a time to be alive. You've heard it before, but man, this thing has grown on me quite a bit. Maybe it's just my play style, but whenever I pick this thing up in the early game, I often find myself with far more money than I usually have. If you're a relatively aggressive player and are still learning the ropes and identifying threats in a fast manner, then I'd recommend to avoid this item as even taking the smallest amount of damage will drain your gold quickly. But if you're pretty comfortable with the game and have been steering clear of the crown, give it a shot. It may surprise you. Lastly, another new lunar, the Defiant Gouge. This thing is awesome. It essentially spawns a combat shrine's worth of monsters every time you interact with any shrine. Blood, Mountain, Chance, Order, heck, even other combat shrines will give you a group of baddies to take down. The reason I'm giving it a B, however, is due to the fact that it scales poorly. Very poorly. As in, you do not want it in your inventory past the first loot. Early on, it is a godsend to get multiple combat shrines per stage, and it will drastically speed those stages up. However, once you get to the point where monsters are already spawning out the butt, and combat shrines spawn scavengers, overloading worms, or a pack of overloading Elder Lemurians, yeah, you can probably see the issue. Still, you should definitely try the gouge out early on. Moving on now to A tier, starting with Beads of Fealty. The effect is extremely vague. In fact, there's no way you could possibly figure out what it's supposed to do just by reading it. Grabbing a Beads grants you access to a special boss fight upon obliteration at the Celestial Obelisk. You fight at random one of four preset Lunar Scavengers, and upon their defeat, you get 15 Lunar Coins instead of the usual five. But if you fail, you get nothing. Pretty cool item and definitely worth the coins to grab if your goal is to just go as long as possible and not stop at the final boss. Lastly, Focused Convergence. It speeds up your teleporter on every single stage. Need I say more? Yes, actually. While the charge time is reduced, so is the area you charge within. This is hard capped at three stacks, so never take more than three else you're wasting your hard earned <coughs> Lunar Coins. At three stacks, the TP area is so small that you'll be entirely outside of it after pressing your movement key like once or twice in any direction. Kinda hard to fight Magma Worms and Imp Overlords in that small of an area, let alone everything else that spawns. Still a pretty good item to take just a single stack of and save quite a bit of... Now for S tier and the final lunar, Gesture of the Drowned. There's no competition for the gesture because it just does not have a downside. Activating your equipment off cooldown may be an issue in select few cases, such as having a prey on and completely missing the shot, which I would, uh, I would never do that. But for the most part, automatic activation is amazing to have and oh, it also gives you less cooldown. Yeah, the gesture is unlike literally all other lunar items with its distinct lack of choice. As in, if you see it, you get it, period. We've made it, finally, to the last category of rankings, equipment. I'm including both regular and lunar equipment in these same rankings as you only have one equipment slot regardless of type. Before we begin, I want to quickly discuss the elite aspects, which technically are equipment since they do occupy your slot but are actually more like regular items due to only having passive effects. I have a separate video covering the details on each aspect, but the gist of it is that none of them are worth your equipment slot. But if you really, really wanted to take one, take the lightning one, silence between two strikes. But you really should get an actual equipment instead of the aspects. I know they're rare. I know, I know, believe me. I know you don't, no, don't do it. Ah! Okay, uh, let's start with the actual equipment here in F tier. Yes, this is the first F rank coming in hot, the radar scanner. Just use your eyeballs to find the loot. Sure, if you get it and see an equipment drone, toss it over to it so it can use it twice before it dies and loses it permanently. Go ahead and have a blast. It doesn't change the fact that it's a complete waste of your equipment slot. Next and last, the spinal tonic. Now, whoa, 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 wait, hold on there, partner. Spinal tonic only gets an F if you have no additional effects on your equipment. So no fuel cells, no Sobon catalyst, and no gesture of the drown. If if you have any number of those things, it gets significantly better. The downside of receiving an affliction is just far too dangerous to be gambled with, and thus I recommend to avoid it until you get at least a couple of any cooldown reducing effects to decrease the time that you have to play with those afflictions. I probably should have mentioned beforehand that the afflictions are negated while you're under the influence of the tonic. Permanent uptime is achievable, actually quite easily, with one gesture and at least three fuel cells or additional gestures. And in cases where you have permanent uptime, I give 
tonic and a not an s because once you have the permanent uptime there's no additional benefit you can get from it which is not the case for other equipments like the royal capacitor moving on to d tier starting with blast shower you won't be inflicted with too many debuffs to warrant sacrificing your damage equipment for a blast shower however if you have nothing else i guess it's kind of useful it's actually kind of ironic that the best use i can think of for the blast shower is to reset the cooldown of your ice and fire bands because that 10 second window actually counts as a debuff for whatever reason you can get some pretty wild shenanigans going with a perma uptime blast shower and multiple stacks of each band maybe give that a shot instead of using it to you know actually cleanse ignites and stuff next eccentric vase it creates a little zip line from yourself to your target that you can traverse quite quickly however the time saved by using it to get across a map is not worth the equipment slot in any situation that i can think of there are much better options next effigy of grief while it was updated in the current patch to now be thrown wherever you are looking and thank god for that and you no longer have to go and retrieve it afterwards as it has five uses per stage those changes were not enough to warrant its use over other equipments yes you'll be hearing that line a lot more next glowing meteorite uh if you want to troll your teammates and honestly troll yourself too grab this thing and watch the ensuing chaos that follows otherwise can you guess what i'm gonna say huh can you take something else next the backup it's way better on captain than on everybody else but it's still not that good even on him the drones do inherit his passive but they deal no damage and they are there solely to draw attention off of you just pick something else i got you again no but i'm serious pick something else next the crowd funder 100 damage per shot is extremely low even if you do have a crazy amount of on hit items to scale it with yes the bleed changes makes this a more lucrative option on paper but in reality if you're already at the point of applying a stupid amount of bleed you probably don't need the crowd funder to help you with that take something else Lastly, forgive me, please. This is another new addition to the arsenal of items and equipment, and while its theme is awesome, its actual effectiveness is low. Now, yes, the more on-kill items you receive, such as Will of the Wisp, Ceremonial Daggers, Gore's Tomes, etc., the better this becomes. But due to its small impact area and pure reliance on your on-kill effects, unless you have crazy amounts of them, it's just not that useful. If you do have crazy amounts of on-kills, then I would give it an A or even an S, depending on the level of crazy. But in the majority of your runs, it's not going to do anything that another damaging equipment couldn't already do, but better. Moving on to C tier, starting with Foreign Fruit. It's kind of like a Lepthon Daisy, but in equipment form. It can save you, but chances are if you had another equipment, maybe one that actually deals damage and takes care of threats, you probably wouldn't have been in such a situation to begin with. Next, Hellfire Tincture. I'm putting it here in C tier because it was buffed, but there are too many variables to pull an effective use off of a Hellfire. Are you melee? If not, why do you even have this thing instead of something else with range? Okay, you are melee. How much mobility do you have? Can you get up to that magma worm elite greater wisp or worship unit no oh well uh just take these lemurians out instead okay what you could have done that with a prion nah don't be silly tincture all day baby i apologize for my growing levels of sarcasm you do not want to know how long i've been here writing the script and i can see the end of it in my sight so i'm just booking it forward okay next jade elephant it gives you a whopping 500 armor which is an over 80 percent damage reduction which is pretty thick but again if you had a damaging equipment would you need the defense it provides Probably not. Lastly, Volcanic Egg. The mobility the egg provides is actually pretty useful, especially early on, but it lacks damage and can actually end up getting you killed as you fly through enemies. Would not recommend versus Imp Overlords. Moving on to B tier, starting with Disposable Missile Launcher. It deals some solid damage, but its target acquisition ends up shafting you more often than not. It's a decent choice, but definitely outclassed by others. Next, Milky Chrysalis. The changes to Chrysalis were actually pretty dang strong, and it's not a terrible choice for your equipment slot early on before you get tons of fuel cells and other equipment related items. However, once you reach such a point, invest in those damage stonks for sure. Next, Ocular HUD. Again, a solid choice early on, but only until you reach a decent amount of crit. Once you're at 40% or more, I would recommend dropping the Ocular, if not sooner than that, for something else because the more crit you have, the less impactful it becomes. Next, Primordial Cube. Grabbing things and pulling them all to the same location is useful, sure, especially if that location is off of a cliff, but its effect is avoided entirely by bosses and even some other high threat enemies like parents and imps who will simply teleport out of its area. Still, not a bad choice if you want to clump and dump as they do call it. I really hope no one calls it that. Next, Samarang. Bleed change is good. Samarang, still not that good. A few stacks of bleed on a boss past the first four stages is not going to do much. The real benefit of the Samarang comes from its shotgun effect of slapping a target with all the blades at once, and surprise, surprise, there are better choices for raw damage. The blades will also completely stop and fall to the ground if they even nick the smallest of terrain, making it a bad choice for those close-range encounters near walls and such. Lastly, the newly added 
added Supermassive Leech. Aside from the Mired Urn, which doesn't really count anyway, the Supermassive Leech is currently the only form of damage based healing that we have, and it's a pretty darn good one at that. You heal instantly for 20% of all of your damage over the next 8 seconds. This makes it a great tool to use when you've yet to acquire a lot of healing. Otherwise, if you're near cap or totally capped crit and you have just a couple sites, it's not worth taking a super massive leech beyond such a point. Moving on now to A tier, starting with Gnarled Wood Sprite. With the changes to difficulty scaling, there are quite a few more monsters looking around once you get past the first few stages, so the Wood Sprite's continual healing plus the burst on activation can prove extremely useful to have in some high threat situations. Accidentally step on a magma worm? No problem, Wood Spites got you back. Next, the newly added Gorag's Opus. Hugely increased movement and attack speed for all allies for the entire duration, regardless of where they are on the map. Sounds pretty good to me. It's worth noting here that this item is bugged on the captain specifically and only in single players. It has zero effect, so hopefully that gets fixed pretty soon. Next, the Preon Accumulator. The time old classic returns and retains the A rank. There is no better tool than the Preon to wipe out large groups of enemies and singular threats alike. The only thing keeping it from an S rank is its 140 second cooldown, which is the longest in the entire game. Getting to stage 3 by 10 minutes is absolutely still a viable option in hopes that you get Rally Point Delta for this big chungus of an equipment. Lastly, Recycler. The ability to reroll your teleporter drop every stage at a bare minimum, but more importantly, any random reds you come across, and especially the guaranteed reds of Abyssal Depths and Siren's Call, makes the Recycler a very solid choice of an equipment. This and the Wood Sprite are the two exceptions to my quite arbitrary rule of equipment need to deal damage. We've made it. The final ranking of the entire list, and boy what a send off, it is Royal Capacitor. This is the only S tier equipment in my mind because it's just that far ahead of everything else. Sure, it got a slight delay with the Artifacts 2.0 update, but that was more of a change for scavengers, and that literally just does not matter. I maybe miss one shot for every 30 or so that I pump out, and oh no, what am I gonna do for a whole 20 seconds while I wait for it to come off a cooldown, presuming I've gotten literally nothing to aid its cooldown recovery in my run this far? You just can't cannot beat 3000% damage on a 20 second cooldown. And that does it for the complete item and equipment tier list for Risk of Rain 2's full release. Remember, there is a spreadsheet version in the description below if you want an easier to follow display of the list. What did you think of the list? You are undoubtedly going to have at least one different opinion than me, so let me know with a comment below and a like or dislike on the video. You can check out my stream at twitch.tv slash wooldygaming, consider joining our Discord server as well. Thank you for watching and be on the lookout for my best loadouts and survivor tier list videos coming in 